Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. What I want to talk about in today's video is minimizing pitch. I think it's the forgotten part of suspension design, and you can see it when you watch cars just drive down the road. So let's take a look at what pitch is, why it's important to minimize it, and how basically cars of today, well, those engineers seem to have forgotten about it. So pitch is the up-down movement of the front versus the rear of the car. If we imagine the front of a car going over a speed hump, it goes up, and then when the back of the car goes over the same speed hump, the back goes up. Okay, so front, back, this sort of pitching motion. And of course, the same thing will happen on individual wheel bumps as well. Now, why is pitch bad? Well, it's bad because it's the thing that we as people riding in cars find most offensive in its action. It's not the up and down movement so much. It's not even the sideways, the roll movement so much. It's quick pitch accelerations. And if you think of your head on top of your body, whipping back and forth as you go over those bumps that induce pitch, you can see it would be very, very discombobulating. All right, so how has pitch been attempted to be minimized over the years. And this is why it's so important to look at what's happened in the past so we actually understand what is happening now. So to reduce pitch, there's basically three different approaches that can be taken. The first is to increase the length of the wheelbase, the distance between the front and rear axles. The second is to have a softer front suspension than rear. And that's a particularly interesting one. We'll come back to that in a lot more detail in a moment. And the third approach is to interconnect the front and rear suspension systems so that they actually work together rather than fighting each other. Again, we'll look at that, not so much detail in this video. All right, reducing pitch by increasing the length of the wheelbase. Well, for a given size of bump, the longer the wheelbase, the less pitch. And so I've done these wonderful drawings down here and you can see there's the same bump on both images. Here we have a longer wheelbase. We can see there's the angle that the car adopts. And here we can see there's a steeper angle because the wheelbase is shorter. So the shorter the wheelbase for a given bump, the greater the pitch inclination that occurs. And we're very familiar with that. If you think of a motorcycle passing over a bump, you know it's got a short wheelbase. You know that motorcycles will pitch a great deal. And one way to get a really good feel for pitch is to watch cars coming towards you, or even other vehicles, coming towards you at night. And if their low beam is flashing, it's because the car is pitching a great deal. And of course, if you see a motorcycle coming towards you at night on a bumpy road, you'll see its headlight flashing constantly as the vehicle undergoes a lot of pitch. So longer wheelbase, reduce pitch. But of course, for a given size of car, that's fixed, isn't it? The next approach, and a really, really interesting one, is to have a softer front suspension than rear. And what I find really interesting about this is this was invented in the mid-1930s, and we can take that invention right back to one man, General Motors' Morris Olley. Olley worked initially for Rolls-Royce in England and then in the US, and then when Rolls-Royce in the US closed, he went to General Motors. GM gave him an enormous budget to do a lot of experimentation with, including on this uh, uh, Cadillac limousine. You can see the weights that have been placed at the front, the weights that have been placed at the back. He was able to change the weight distribution. He was able to change a lot of things with that car. In fact, there were three of them. And he came up with this idea that he called flat ride. Now, flat ride depends on what is called the natural frequencies of the front and rear suspension. Now, stay with me, because this is absolutely fundamental to understanding it. So what's natural frequency? Well, if we put a weight on top of an extended coil spring and we push down on the weight and then we let go, the system will bounce up and down at its natural frequency. And here it is, bouncing up and down, up and down. The stiffer the spring for a given weight, the higher will be the natural frequency, the faster the up and down bounces. So the speed of the up and down bounces, how many occur per second, depends on the stiffness of the spring and also the size of the weight that is acting through it. So if we change either of those, then we're gonna change the natural bounce speed of the system. 
that becomes really important if we want to reduce pitch. Let's take a look at that. So here we've got the same front and rear bounce frequencies. You can see the distance from peak to peak, from trough to trough, is the same on both the front and the back, which means that when the front undergoes a bump, and then a bit later the back undergoes a bump, they are always separated in time, and yet they're trying to do the same thing. So the car is going like this. And this graph shows the resulting pitch, which is very great, and then gradually dies away as the system settles once the bump is passed. But what if we have different front and rear natural frequencies, not the same? And more specifically, what if we make the front natural frequency softer, slower, lower in frequency? Well, here we've got exactly that happening. A slower front frequency, and you can see the ups and downs gradually start to come together in time. Okay, so it starts off, of course, with the front and rear going up and down at different times as they hit the bump at different times, but gradually the system settles all right, and as the bumps get smaller and smaller, they start to part again in the natural frequencies. But you can see the pitch dies away very, very fast. Now this was a huge breakthrough. The idea that if we ran softer front springs than rear springs, softer front natural frequency than rear, we could get rid of pitch really, really quickly. But it was a huge problem in the 1930s because everyone was running solid front axles with leaf springs. And if you try and soften that suspension to the degree that was needed to achieve this, you had wheel shimmy, you had all sorts of problems. And so this actually led to the adoption of independent front suspension on all of GM's cars in the late 1930s, all with coil springs. Now, here's what Ollie said in 1934, and I think it's worth looking at it, because you know th this is absolutely fundamental, and yet I think it's been largely forgotten. He wrote, now due to varying passenger and fuel loads, if the average passenger car is sprung so that under absolute maximum loads, the rear deflection is equal to the front deflection, at the lightest load under which it can be driven, the rear deflection will be equal to be about 70% of the front. And of course, the greater the deflection, the softer the spring. A car sprung in this way comes the nearest to giving an impression of level riding under all conditions of load, road, and speed. And that was such a seminal understanding that here we have the McLaren F1 in the technical paper that I read on the development of that car suspension that I quote in the book, they actually do exactly the same thing in terms of front rear natural frequencies. And as the paper says, to reduce pitch. So we're not talking about something that was just like oh, came and went. We're talking about something that is absolutely fundamental to giving cars low pitch over bumps. What about the final one? Reducing pitch by interconnecting the front and rear suspension systems. Now in these approaches, when the front goes up over a bump, the rear wheel gets pushed down, and so the car doesn't have as much pitch. That's how they are interconnected, front to rear, on the left side and the right side separately. Now, only three cars that I've been aware of that have been produced in large numbers have ever done this, but they were produced in large numbers, millions and millions and millions of them. The 1948 Citroen 2CV, which I cover in another one of my videos. The 1955 Packard Torsion Level Ride, a really innovative suspension systems. And my pick of the best suspension systems for passenger cars ever developed, the 1960s Hydrolastic and then the later 1970s Hydrogas is the Hydrolastic one, which I think was the huge breakthrough, fitted to millions of British uh, cars, BMC and then later British Leyland. Now, all of those approaches, those three approaches, lengthening the wheelbase, uh, running a lower uh, front natural frequency compared with rear and interconnecting the front and rear suspensions dramatically reduce pitch, dramatically. But what about today? Well, yeah, cars have got longer, so I suppose they're achieving a reduced pitch in terms of wheelbase extension. Softer front suspension than rear, you just can't see that on many cars of today. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to find a place where you can watch a, a car, a series of cars going over bumps, a highway or something like that with a, a clear bump, and watch the amount of pitch they develop. And it's quite astonishing. If they're coming towards you, you'll see them go like this, 
it's now very, very few cars that do what you see is, is called a heave. And a heave is when the whole car just goes up and down levelly, not pitching, as it goes over the bumps. And in fact, I, I live on bumpy roads and I spend all my time looking at cars when I'm out driving. And really the only cars you see with low pitch and having effective heave are quite uh, softly sprung all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, off-road cars. And I think that's one reason why they've, they've absolutely surged in popularity because they have a decent ride, whereas most cars of today are way over damped. The engineers have completely forgotten about front rear natural frequency relationships with some noticeable exceptions like the McLaren F1 of now a couple of decades ago. And as for cars interconnecting the front and rear suspension systems, there aren't any. There are no production cars built in large numbers that even do that. And yet this was all invented up to 60 or 70 years ago. In fact, in the case of softer front rather than rear suspension, way back in the 1930s, 90 years ago. So look at cars, feel the cars when you ride in them. It can be confused for being under damped because it feels like the back's going like this, but the front's going down as the back's going up. It's not under damped. It just has the wrong relationship between front and rear natural frequencies. It's all covered in my book. It's the first book ever written on the history of car suspension. And in it, I cover a whole range of these sorts of cars. I cover all of those cars and people I have mentioned there. And you can learn a huge amount by looking at what was successful in the past, what is successful today, because I go right up to, to current cars, and what's been forgotten over that uh, 120 years. Books out now, available from Amazon in your country. Thank you.